Jim is the teaching pastor at Orlando Grace Church in uh, Flor- Orlando, Florida, and a graduate of Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando, council member of the Gospel Coalition, which I understand is meeting this uh, week over in Fort Worth. He is the host of the As in Heaven podcast, and it's an interesting podcast because they take an extensive dive into one challenging subject per season. So it's, a, it's sort of in-depth journalism, I guess you'd say. He's married to Angela. Together they have four children, and Jim and Angela speak for the Family Life's Weekend to Remember uh, marriage conference. But today, the reason that we've asked Jim to come is because he has co-authored a book with the fascinating title, The Great Dechurching. The Great Dechurching. Who's leaving? Why are they going? And what will it take to bring them back? Jim, welcome to Dallas Seminary, and thank you for agreeing to be part of our chapel today. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to it. So the instant, the nanosecond I heard that title, I was immediately interested because it turns out that 31 years ago, I myself had written a book called Exit Interviews, Revealing Stories of Why People Are Leaving the Church. Now, at that time... That seemed like a non-starter because the fact was people were literally streaming in the front door of churches. It was the heyday of the rise of the megachurch. And in fact, a megachurch, which at the time, first they defined it as a church of a thousand or more people. Later they upped it to a church of 2,000 or more people. But at the time, it was estimated, the research showed that there was one megachurch being planted every week over a several year period. So who cares about the people that aren't going to church? I mean, they're they're the unchurched, right? So then we'd try to get them in the front door. However, having grown up in the church, uh, I began to notice that many of the people that I'd gone to church with and camps and Bible studies and all the activities when I was a child, I'm looking around and they're not there anymore. And I'm like, well, what happened? And I began to notice that even though there were a lot of people coming in the front door of the church, there was actually a pretty wide back door in the church, but nobody was really paying attention to it. So I went around and interviewed 65 disillusioned Christians to find out their experience. I just wanted to get their stories. And what Jim's uh, research showed in the book that we're going to talk about today is that I was actually seeing the beginnings. It really probably wasn't the beginnings. It was, it was more just the, the acceleration of a trend that has been going on for decades and now is a massive decrease in church attendance. I'm going to let you give the, the, the uh, shocking number. Uh, but Jim's co-author, I want to make sure I mention Michael Graham because you guys sound like you're pretty close. Yeah. He's the program director for the podcast uh, that, uh, that Jim has. And, well, program director Progr- for the Keller the, Center. I'm and, sorry. That's right, executive but, producer of the podcast. Program director for the Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics, executive producer for As in Heaven. And what these guys did, you spent two years um, working with two of the top sociologists in the country to conduct the most thorough, comprehensive, academic review board approved, nationwide, quantitative study ever done. It's a mouthful. On the phenomenon of people leaving the church. That's right. So you guys did your homework, or you had those guys do your homework. <laughs> it, was a te- it was a team effort, but yes, that's, you're right. We commissioned them to do a study that did not exist because we wanted to learn about a phenomenon that we didn't feel like was, had adequate data behind it to understand. And so tell us more about that phenomenon and the, the kind of the arresting thing that got your attention. So if I back up just a little bit, it began as a project just of cultural exegesis in Orlando, Florida. I grew up there. I moved around the world for 15 years, came back. And Orlando is interesting because when I was growing up, it felt like it was becoming kind of this Christian mecca. In the church world, you had uh, First Presbyterian Church was the second largest mainline church in the United States. The First Baptist, Jim Henry, was president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Joel Hunter was pioneering things in the in the uh, the uh, non-denominational tech space. Even Benny Hinn was there. So like whatever your stream, like something was there that you could be excited about. Institutionally, Reformed Theological, Seminary came, Campus Crusade, Wycliffe, Pioneers, Ligonier, all that, Ligonier, R.C. Sproul. 
And then you fast forward to 2018, and we have the same percentage of evangelicals as New York City and Seattle. But, if, but what was, we were really wrestling with was why does it feel so different culturally than New York City and Seattle? So I'm not a data guy and I didn't set out to write a book. Mike is a data guy. And uh, we began to ask questions and realize anecdotally, this is a big issue. This is not just an Orlando issue, but most of the people, the vast majority of the people who we would interact with who, used, who do not go to church used to do so. And the reason Orlando felt different than New York City and Seattle is because they still carried with them, many, in many cases, uh, biblical values, uh, maybe some biblical baggage, uh, and in many cases seemed to really be Christian. So we wanted to know more and it just wasn't there. Anecdotally, there were two things that really made us want to pursue this. Uh, my wife was a student at Reformed Theological Seminary at the time. She wanted to do a, project, a research paper on de-churching and her professor said, I know Jim's into this, but there's, there's nothing, and I would love it, but there's nothing to research. There's literally nothing. You can't even do a paper on it. So I logged that away. And then I was speaking at a global donor event for a, for a ministry here in the United States. And I had a little 10 minute thing on de-churching. I opened for a very well-known pastor who did a great job. And I had this moment, this surreal moment, where I realized afterwards I had a line of people to talk to me and this pastor's grabbing coffee by himself. And, and I couldn't figure out, what, this doesn't make any sense at all. I'm a nobody, his talk was great, this is this guy. And then I realized as I was talking to people, I'm talking about their children and their grandchildren and their nephews and their nieces. And, and it was just this moment, this is not just a number study. We are talking about real people with real souls who have real families. And so our thesis was that we thought we were possibly in the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of our country. And so we commissioned Dr. Ryan Burge and Dr. Paul Jupe to do that mouthful of a study. And we in fact proved it, that we are in the, fast, the largest and fastest religious shift in the history of our country as 40 million adult Americans who used to go to church now don't. So the way we define de-church is important someone who used to go to church monthly and now goes less than one time per year. So I say that's important because Easter was last Sunday. If somebody only goes on Easter, they're not even considered de-churched by our study. So we would argue that the problem is even bigger than what we're putting forward. We just wanted to be very conservative and responsible in the way that we do our research. But 40 million adult Americans, largely in the past uh, 25 years, this phenomenon really began in the 90s and it has evolved in, in many ways. But we, we, after that, we did two more successive studies to understand why people are leaving, where they're going, and a deep dive specifically in evangelicalism. So 40 million, I mean, that, that kind of moves the needle, right? I, it, 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 hugely. So if you, if you look at our previous uh, largest shift, most people don't realize it's the 25 years post-Civil War is our previous largest shift. As people are returning to church, going for the first time, immigrating, converting, all of the above, our shift in terms of percentage as a pop, you know, the, the size of the country is 25% greater than that going the opposite direction. In terms of numbers, we're talking about more people than the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and all of the Billy Graham crusades combined going the opposite direction. And, and again, because we're talking about people, it matters because even though, as we make the case, many of the de church are still Christians, the children, statistically speaking, of the de church, they will be unchurched. So there is a, a, a really important and unique generational opportunity in front of us that goes way beyond butts and seats and even politics. We're talking about souls. Now, at least when I was writing my book, that I guess you'd call it the traditional view of somebody who was no longer going to church is that, you know, if they stop going to church, well, that, that just shows that they were never really committed to Christ in the first place. And and they may even be, you know, the prodigal son. You know, they they kind of were in it and now they're off into drugs and other stuff. And, yeah. you know, we got to... But, but, you didn't find that. I mean, there's some of that, but not much of that relative to the whole 40 million, right? Yeah, so your perspective is one 
one perspective that you hear a lot. The other, because what, what we're getting to is why they left. Right. And so if your media diet is a little more to the left, you're, you're going to hear it's the church's fault. The church uh, is closed-minded, bigoted, there's racism, misogyny, scandal, things like that. If your media diet is more to the right, you're going to hear it's the culture's problem. This is be- happening because of the sexual revolution, secular progressivism. And what we found is while Both are right to a degree. Neither explains the lion's share of de-churching in the United States. The number one reason for de-churching in the United States is simply, I'm moved. And so we began to make this this distinction between those who had de-churched casually and those who were de-churched casualties. Of the 40 million people who had left houses of worship, which is probably helpful to say, 20 million came from Roman Catholic and mainline backgrounds, 15 million from evangelical churches, and five from what we would not consider to be Orthodox Christian houses of worship. So... 30 million of those left for boring pedestrian reasons. <laughs> and in many cases, in, we'll, we, when we get more specifically into evangelicalism, you see that a lot of the people, even though they've left the church, it doesn't seem like they've left the faith. Some have left very intentionally. Again, uh, we're talking about 10 million of the 30 million, but the 30 million might still have a very positive understanding of the church, but life circumstances have happened in such a way that... Um, that have caused them to, in in their words, get out of the habit. And I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but you you ended up segmenting out about five different categories of these de-churched people. So this is one of the things that's very important to us, and I'm not just trying to sell the book, but like if you read the book, like you'll, you'll get more than you're going to get here. But we used an algorithm called machine learning to take this massive amount of data. So we're talking about over 7,000 participants, over 600 data points, and to bring them, uh, help us understand by combining common answers. And so it developed these four groups that the social scientists then helped us to figure out what are we looking at. And within Evan Evangelicalism, we learned that 51% of the de-churched evangelicals say they're willing to come back today. Like this 15 million, so eight, about eight, around 8 million uh, are, of the de-churched evangelicals say they're willing to come back today. And what we want to really learn ourselves and help other people's people to learn is that the de-churched are not a monolithic group. We need to do in our discipleship and evangelism and cultural engagement, we need to be able to discern which type of de-churched person am I looking at? Because some of them are very unwilling to return. Some of them are very willing to return and it seems like they're Christians. And so we do some legwork to divide the four categories, cultural Christian, de-churched mainstream evangelical, ex-evangelical, and BIPOC de-churched. BIPOC, give us that. Black, black indigenous persons of color. Right. So, as uh, a whole separate category. As, as, well, what, what's, fascinating, category. what's fascinating is we hid race and ethnicity from machine learning. It could not see that as a factor and still gave us an entire group based on common answer choices that was 0% white. Because as social scientists say, race casts a very long shadow in the data. You don't need to see race to understand common viewpoints, common struggles, common scenarios. So you've got uh, uh, de-churched so-called mainstream evangelicals and then you've got ex-evangelicals. Sort those out. Okay. Well, let me do that. Let me, let me start with cultural Christian because okay. that provides a contrast. So cultural Christians, we, we use this term, uh, they're about... This is the largest of the evangelical group, about 8 million people. Imagine a, um, it's more male than female, so overwhelmingly white group, male, uh, who grew up going to church, doesn't anymore, didn't leave for any real reason, has a positive experience of the church. But when we looked at their orthodoxy scores, it was abysmal. Only 1% of this group believed that Jesus was the son of God. So what we're looking at are people who left the church. This is what you're talking about initially. They, they were never Christians to begin with, as best we can tell. So that's one group. Then you get over to the de-churched mainstream evangelicals. This group looks almost the same. They're, it's gonna be more f- female than male, but didn't leave with uh, in really any hurt. Didn't, they didn't leave intentionally. It just happened. This group, though, their orthodoxy scores are higher than those who still go to church. <laughs> of them would say that Jesus is the son of God. 100% of this 2.5 million people say they are willing to come back to the church today. 
So I have this, this, I have four questions that I walk through when I'm doing it in my own personal ministry. And if I can realize, oh, this is a de church mainstream evangelical, I just invite them to church. And, and I'm batting 100% right now in my, in my personal ministry, and most of them have stuck. I mean, it's just they're, they're, they seem to be believers, convicted by the Holy Spirit. They've more recently gotten out of the habit. Then you go over to the ex-evangelical, which we struggle choosing this word because it is so used in popular culture. But we think of the ex-evangelical as somebody who is just done with the faith, they've deconstructed, they don't want anything to do with evangelicalism or what social, social scientists call white, ev- white evangelicalism. Uh, and th- it would be right about that last part, part. This group is done, but this group, 97% would say that Jesus is the son of God. Mm-hmm. So while they've left with significant hurt, um, and, and they left so very intentionally and would say they are not willing to come back to white evangelicalism. They are, it seems like still, they still have a genuine faith and they would be open, so they say at this point. Um, of course, the Holy Spirit can do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do, uh, but they would be open to cell groups, home churches, black Protestantism, even some forms like your Episcopal diocese here that's conservative and right. holds on to the, you know, the historic gospel. That, is a, that would be something they would say they'd be willing to return to. What's interesting is we think of an ex-evangelical as like a young, maybe higher educated kind of person who's who's uh, learned so much and experienced something that they've just left and left loudly. The lion's share of the ex-evangelicals are middle-aged white women for whom America is not working. They're the lowest income, lowest um, educated of all the profiles that were put together. I wanted to ask you about that while we're there because you have a wonderful, well, not wonderful, it's, a, it's an arresting little section in the book where you, I believe, uh, cite a sociologist who came up with some research to show that, in, in, in a sense, America is set up to work really well for people who have certain... Who stay on the Certain American advantages track. going for them, and they stay on the track. Yeah, yeah. But if you get off that track, however it happens, or you never got on it to begin with, things are a much different picture. And, and then you tied it to the thought that, gosh, have we set up the church basically to work well for that track, but if you're not on that track, then things start to fall apart. You know, it's funny, sometimes I do interviews with people and I'm like, you haven't read the book. I was like, this guy's read the book, I can tell. <laughs> um, we were on the Ben Shapiro show and I was like, yeah, you haven't read our book. But, <laughs> um, but he said it was, everybody needs to buy it. And I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> but yes, the, the, uh, America is set up to, let me say this, America works best for those on a certain track. And that track is go to high school, graduate, go to college, then get married, then have children, then stay married. That's the, and now if you get off that track, America doesn't work as well for you unless you have fa- some sort of family safety net or something. Um, and, and let me make clear, yeah. as, I, as I read the book, I got the sense you're not criticizing that track. You're not saying that's a bad thing. The, the framers kind of set things up to work a certain way. It's a good track. And, and it worked for those folks. It, what, what we would lament, if you go back to you know, the early New Testament period, one of the reasons Christianity boomed is because it worked. It, 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 it engaged and helped people who were so far off the Roman track of success. Right. And so we're not fighting the American track here. We're just saying Christianity should work for all types of people, especially the disenfranchised and those who, have, who, are, who are not benefiting from the natural streams of a culture. Yeah. And then you get to the de-churched BIPOC BIPOC, is that BIPOC, Black Indigenous Persons of Color. Yeah, so 0% white. So if you, the stereotypical person in this group, imagine a, an African-American man lives in Atlanta, has done very well in uh, business. It, this is the highest education, highest uh, er, income earning group. Now, this is one of those areas, w- there are more studies warranted. Um, dechurching among Asian er- Amer- Americans is something that we'd like to look more into. The BIPOC group as well. Um, for what it's worth, we, we have had to raise $100,000 just to do the research, which is why books like this don't get written um, often because there's no money to be made all at, at the end of the day. But, um, but this group is interesting because they, 
they are a mix of both casualty and casualty. Um, largely, they left the church establishing their young professional careers. They're now in their 40s and 50s. So they've de-churched for quite some time. But like the other categories, if we, when you look at what it's gonna take to bring them back, I mean, we hear a lot of friends if I'm lonely, if I move and want to make friends, if a friend invites me, if there's a good pastor. I mean, it, it, this transcends all the categories. Um, the, the be because at the end of the day, this is a belonging study and we're seeing people's desire for belonging mm. in, in, there. And we would also argue God has designed us to belong as a member of the body of Christ. So, but it is interesting to see all those threads uh, throughout these very different types of profiles. You know, if I sort of synthesize what you said there, so your study seems to show that for at least 40 million people, all these years they've gone to, gone to church, they've gone to church, but they didn't feel like they belonged at church. Is that... I, I think that's very fair, but the type of person who doesn't belong evolved itself over time. So de-churching really ramped up in the 90s. Now, social scientists would say, when you see a spike like that, it doesn't come out of nowhere, they would be right, but we don't have time to get into that. But in the 90s, with the fall of the Soviet Union, with the rise of the internet, the rise of the religious right, and 9-11, and I can pull, I can explain that if you want, but all those things resulted in people saying, uh, giving people freedom to say, I'm not a Christian. And I don't have to worry about people calling me a communist. <laughs> you know, you can look at 9-11, say that's what religious fundamentalism does. If this is what politics is, I'm out. I'm now online with other people, looking at other worldviews that I can't comfortably research within my own social context. And so in the 90s, you had people de-churching from the secular left, largely from mainline and Roman Catholic spaces. We would argue who were already kind of leaning that direction. They already didn't feel like there was a sense of belonging in the church because they didn't have the faith. But if you move forward to now, de-churching is happening on the secular right at twice the speed of the secular left, catching up in full number to those who de-church from the secular right. And so this group is going to feel like they don't belong in a church if it is not politically syncretized. So this is gonna, you know, you have polit largely more recently, um, if you think of Jesus and politics, there has to be a horse and a cart. And so we would argue Jesus is the horse and there are political implications to the gospel. There are social and ethical implications that can't help but overlap with politics. That's probably the better way to say that. But for some people, politics is the, is the cart or sorry, the horse. the horse, and Jesus is the cart. And so those, those are gonna be people who are upset that we're not more politically involved. They don't feel the belonging because they're, they're, their political flag flies higher than their Jesus flag. And so there's a, there is at its heart a belonging issue, but it's very different than you know, the secular left of the late 90s. Mm. Well, let's talk then, start to talk about some of the implications of yeah. this because they're vast. Um, and as we're having this conversation, again, I, if you have questions, we want you to bring them over to the brown bag so that you can kind of get d deeper into what matters to you. Because each person in this room, I dare say, probably knows somebody that you're thinking of that doesn't go to church anymore we're at your church. I mean, I can think of a lot of them, you know, at, at my age. And, and with behind each of them, there's a story and each one has a unique story. And yet you start to put those stories together as you basically have, and you start to see this isn't just one isolated thing. There's yeah. trends in, in play here and lots of factors and forces are, are involved. And I mean, one of the places to start is, so if you're a pastor in a church and people are leaving what are the implications of that for you and how you pastor people? So you're talking about the back door. I like in the beginning how you opened with front door and back door. I mean, I, I, the implications, um, seeing people leave is hard. And, and any pastor who's walked through lots of people leaving as I have in certain seasons, <laughs> um, it's hard. And I think, you know, personally, we need to take a long look in the mirror and ask God, am I, do I, am I doing the right 
who am I serving here? Am I really serving you or am I, am I, am I trying to serve man? Because often, I mean, often, you're not gonna be able to do both in the church. But uh, I th- the starting point for us as exit interviews, we would have, just like you wrote, we would wanna sit down with the people who are leaving and I would not wanna do that in isolation. I'd wanna do that with other elders in our church. And here, all right, why are you leaving? Are there some of the reasons, just like, okay, that makes sense. We're not gonna be the type of church you're looking for. Um, but so often they're like, okay, that's, that's something we need to hear. Um, and something we need to look at. So for every church, I, I, looking at your back door is gonna be different, but it starts with genuinely listening even, even when it hurts. Yeah, well, when I did my interviews with people, um, you know, again, 31 years ago, honestly, a lot of pastors, they heard about what I was doing. They're like, well, that's, I'm glad you're doing that. But I'm so busy with these new people that are coming in. I, I don't have time for people that are leaving. And frankly, it sounds terrible, but some of them had the attitude, you know, they were kind of problem people to begin with, good riddance. You know, of course, my heart winces just to even think about that. What I discovered was that most of these folks told me that they'd leave, like, okay, this week I'm not going to church. And then the next week, "Eh, I'm not going to church. And they would basically wait for six weeks to see if anybody from the church noticed they weren't there and, and bothered to just give them a phone call or reach out to them and say, hey, we haven't seen you in the last couple of weeks. You doing okay? What's going on? And if nobody contacted them, they'd, they'd start looking around or they'd wander off to some other thing that, you know, one of the things, so we do have a free resource at dechurching.com. There's a toolkit to assess the front and back doors. But one of the things that we say on there is, do you have a way for uh, knowledgeably praying for every person in your church? Now, this, this, you can scale this to different sizes. I mean, it doesn't have to be, mean that it's the senior pastor or teaching pastor who, do, who knows everybody. And, and that works at a certain size. After a certain size, it doesn't work. But do you have a system where everybody in the church can be prayed for knowledgeable, knowledgeably and where you would notice if somebody uh, isn't going anymore? We, we would argue you, every church should have that system. It's just gonna look different in every church. But if you can't do that, we're, we're contributing to the back door. Well, I mean, Jesus, who was the ultimate good shepherd, said, my, uh, I, I know my sheep by name. Yes. And we're, if, if you're an under-shepherd, it, it seems to be, it behooves <laughs> you to know your sheep by name. That's right. Right. Let's talk about um, implications for youth ministries, college ministries, and young adult ministries. Yeah. Because you pointed out that there were three stages of life when people seem to typically have the greatest challenges with their faith. Yes. One is in high school. The second is the four years after high school. And then the next is that season in young adult years trying to establish a vocation and get started in life. Right. And that's when they leave. And so it, it, it's the, the, your highest risk of dechurching during those ages of 13 to 30. Um, and it also intersects with moving and all these other reasons that people de-church. But there's no question, in terms of age range, that's the age range. And you do, as you said, you, for, you have high school for most people, um, for most evangelicals, college, and then establishing a, a career. Um, it's, we have taken these three different stages and divided them up. And really, given your context, it's going to determine which one you're going to focus more on, or at least first on. For us, uh, it's not lost on me that I have three kids now in the age range of 13 to 18. So I'm, uh, I'm not the most objective in this. So I want to shore that up first. And so we've been working, um, well, first, the study showed us that a lot of children I know a lot of de-church adults when they were children between that age range would say that uh, we didn't feel like church was a place that we could express doubt. We didn't feel like I could be honest with what I'm struggling with. The, the messages did not answer the questions that we're really asking. Pa- my parents seemed to care more about um, 
winning a political battle than they did Jesus. So these were some common threads. We asked questions about the fruit of the spirit without calling it the fruit of the spirit. And a lot of people said, I just wish my parents had exhibited uh, more fruit of the spirit. And so what we wanna do as a church, we know that we're, we're not outsourcing the discipleship of our children to the church, but we began to ask, what are we doing to come alongside the parents? And so we're in the process with the help of Rooted Ministries has actually been very, Rooted Youth Ministries, very helpful for us too. Um, um, coming up with what, a, a discipleship plan of what we're going to do with kids, really one to 18, but specifically 13 to 18. When are they gonna learn how to share their faith? When are they gonna learn how to read the Bible? When are they gonna learn systematic theology? When are they learning biblical theology? When are they introduced to gender and sexuality issues? So that we can tell the parents, listen, you're still the primary disciplers. This is when we're going to engage the students with these things, just so you know, and we wanna be a team in this. So that's one thing, that there, there's more here, but that's one way that we're investing in that area. In the college years, this is really interesting. Our study has shown, and Brian Burge has gone on to prove, that the more educated an evangelical is, the more likely they are to stay in church. This goes against you know, the historic boogeyman of higher secular education taking our children away. Education is not a, 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 a lack of education is not a factor in de-churching. Actually, it's the lower educated, lower income that are being affected by de-churching the most. In our study, uh, only 3% of evangelicals with master's degrees had de-churched. Mm. And then when you get into the college years, if you... If you have a student who is involved in both a church and a campus ministry, they are three times more likely to continue in the faith. Now, there's something called selection, self-selection bias here because those who are most likely to continue also tend to opt into those two things, but it doesn't negate the reality of, uh, of those two things. And I wanna be really clear when I say church and campus ministry, why I separate those, it can be all done in a church, but what happens if somebody's only involved in a campus ministry, then they don't have a realistic understanding of what it looks like to be involved in a local church after they leave college. But if they're only involved in worshiping in a church and nothing that's helping them get used to this new life on their own, then, then that's going to be a factor too. So a church could do all of this in-house, but um, that has been a real takeaway. And then establishing young, the, the young professional career. This is going to be for people who are doing ministry more in urban and suburban environments, but, um, and this is the, the one we've tapped into probably the least in our local context, but uh, helping people on the onset, and there's gonna be some overlapping with moving, and I'll land the plane here. Um, if you're receiving new people, some of those are establishing a new professional career, what are we doing to mobilize the, the, the points of first contact? So the teachers, school administrators, realtors, the people who, who are there going to meet first and show them the missional value, you're receiving new people to the city, how can you be a real part of connecting them to a healthy local church? Let me go back to the college ministry because I have literally had pastors uh, and church leaders say to me, um, you know, we don't really have a very robust college ministry because college kids come and go and they don't have any money. So th I, I, I have lots of thoughts. I was in college ministry for nine years myself um, and, and, so, and, and in the beginning without a good value of the local church and God brought me um, out of that. I've also been a pastor in a, a Division One SEC town. Um, I remember somebody asking John Piper years ago, um, why do we invest, invest so much in these college students? They're here today and gone tomorrow. And Dr. Piper said, exactly. That's why. They're here today and gone tomorrow. They're coming in, in in one of the most formative stages of their life and they're being sent out to the world. And so that is a significant stewardship. If we don't see that, we're just focusing on our little K kingdom, not the big K kingdom. Well, let me just put a plug in here for the young adults ministries because um, uh, I personally feel like churches are, are missing a massive opportunity and have been forever. The number one issue that any young adult faces and whatever's number two is way back there. The number one issue is what am I going to do with my life? It's an issue of career and calling. And if, if, if I was, you know, in your shoes as a pastor, that's what I would camp on because if I can help somebody discover that, 
And of course, this is an advertisement for giftedness. And you, you've done some great work on this. <laughs> a little front. bit. You have. But when you figure that piece out, first of all, it connects you with God in such a personal way that now your faith, is, it matters to you because it's what God's really given you. But also, any church who helps somebody discover that and get direction in life, the loyalty will never go away. They will, wherever they go, if they go nowhere, they'll stay. But even if they go, they will never, ever, ever forget that you helped them in that profound way. Well, and one question I started to ask because of, of course, we first met through Made to Flourish. Um, and Made to Flourish has really helped. It's a network of churches. It is, and they, there's a lot of focus on uh, faith and works. But I've begun, because of them, begun when I'm meeting with people, asking them, what is the best part about being a Christian in your workplace? And what's the hardest part about being a Christian? And it's really changed the way that I understand the struggles, especially of this, the, the, the 20-somethings establishing their young career and the things, it's influenced how I preach, it's influenced our discipleship, the, how, how urgent it feels to plug them in with other believers in, in their community. Well, let me shift to another implication because we got a bunch of students at DTS who came because they did look at the models of churches we have and they go, well, see, they're not getting the job done. So I'm going to go to church, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to learn how to plant a church. And I'm big on church planting. I'm not knocking it. But, you know, because it's easier to sort of start with a, you know, a blank, piece, a blank canvas, as it were, right? And I, I applaud that. You have some significant implications that you point out that this de-churching phenomenon actually, if I put it this way, works to the advantage of people that want to plant churches if they know what to look for. Yeah, I, I would just say the landscape is changing and, and, and we need to be knowledgeable of this. So if you planted a church in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, t- chances are you were doing something new. You know, whether it was expositional preaching or uh, relevant messages or contemporary music, something you were doing was new. And because of that, you benefited from Christian transfer growth and people came over who knew uh, they, they already had a, 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 enough discipling that they should give, financially support the ministry. And a lot of those churches benefited from that. It's not good or bad, it just is reality. Now, nobody's doing anything new. All right, whatever it is that you want to do, you may, you may be in a unique area of town that, that, that needs it, but the, I, if you are doing something truly new now, I would want to question, like, what are you actually doing? Because we, we see all, especially in a city like Dallas, everything exists. And the re- result is that church planting is returning to the hard work that it always has been of evangelism and discipleship. And, and as we as institutions and churches, we need to be looking at our church planters and thinking, how am I freeing them up for the work of evangelism and discipleship? Because we're, we, we fail them to lay on the burden of, well, if you're not financially uh, self-sufficient in 12 to 24 months, you're doing something wrong. That's not how church planting has worked in the past. It's not how it works in most of this, you know, outside of our Western context, and we need to come alongside our church planters with the resources to help them, to free them up to be able to do the work of evangelism and discipleship. Now, also, it's an added complication. We believe we're going to see a hollowing out of middle, what we call middle-sized churches uh, who don't already own buildings, because once you get to the range of, say, 100 to 300, which is a, a lot of churches are in that range... If you're in a city, how expensive it is to hire a pastor, probably with a family, with a seminary degree, um, pay for a place to worship, unless you have other sources of income or a very wealthy base, um, it's going to be, we're going to see fewer and fewer of that middle-sized church, which is sad because there's such kingdom value in that size church, and I can articulate why, at least why I think there is. Um, so there are lots of implications of church planting. We're doubling down on church planting. We're creating a pipeline to train and disciple church planters. So we believe in it. It's just the landscape is changing. Well, it sounds like you've at least got sort of two broad audiences. You've got the unchurched, you know, which is very much evangelism and apologetics and, and, and so forth. But then now you've got this sizable de-churched and let's just stick with the mainstream evangelicals that 51% have said, I'd probably go back tomorrow if 
Somebody invited me. And, well, and, that's, and that's on the discipleship side. And there, there's- I mean, that's low hanging fruit. low hanging fruit. There is a, there's a church that was planted um, in South Orlando that did exactly that. And they, they saw a big influx. He, he would go and ask the four, so my four questions are something like, uh, did you grow up going to church? Do you go to church now? They say, yes, no. I know they're de-churched. Um, what made you stop going to church? And I can figure out if you're casual or casualty and who is Jesus to you? And in four questions, I can understand, are you a mainstream deep church evangelical? So this church planter was going around asking people these questions, finding this group of people, drawing them relationally in the church plant, and it's been fairly successful. Another church in Columbia, Missouri, took this data early on and they developed digital and personal pathways to identify this group and move them toward embodied worship. And in four months had 300 new worshipers in their church on Sunday. Hmm. Wow. Again, the goal is not just butts and seats. We're talking about souls and generations. I always want to be careful uh, when I say that. And some people, all they need is a nudge. Some need to be at our dinner table. Some are going to need to be in our life for decades and just the Holy Spirit's going to have to do something that none of us can possibly ever do. We just want to come alongside Christians and help create those three categories. Yeah, and then there's this, this group within this whole church movement of the people that have quite literally been abused in churches and by churches. Yeah. And it would be remiss not to kind of point that out and Absolutely. get a word about. So what about these folks? So we have a chapter on this and, um, you know, for a lot of people, and even in our own personal ministry, people leave church because of real abuse and scandal and hypocrisy. And the first thing that we tell them is, you should have left that church. You should have left that church. I'm glad you did. I'm sorry that it was so painful and it took so long, but that doesn't mean that God wants you to leave the church. And, but, but the path back is a slow one, a slow one with a lot of listening. Uh, they should have the expectation that they can talk to the leaders of uh, of a new church and ask them hard questions. Why would what happened to me here, why do you not think it would happen here? Um, so empathy, counseling, curious listening. So start to wrap up a little bit. Um, we had this pandemic and, and the 40 year or the 25 year horizon, it shows that, yeah, obviously a lot of people stopped going to church during the pandemic, they had to but that that's not what started this whole thing. That just was a, a, a further blow on the whole thing. But it did lead to the rise of the, the live stream church. You know, I mean, people are live streaming chapel today, okay? Yeah. And in the book, um, you talk about live streaming, and it's challenging. Those who are able to worship in person but choose not to must be called what they are, de-churched. Now, I'm sure for many, it's like, what? But I, 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 sh I, I watch every Sunday. Yeah. I participate. I pray. I, you know, I sing. How could you call me de -churched? Yeah, this, was, this is probably our most unpopular opinion. But we, we, I mean, if you look at the way, just take Luke and Paul, the way they use the word worship, the way we're told by the author of Hebrews not to neglect the gathering, um, the way we use the term online worship, I would say is an oxymoron given the way that worship is used in the New Testament. Now, does that mean I'm anti-technology? Not at all, not at all. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we've been talking about some stories. Uh, there was, there's a church in Dallas that was using um, virtual, like head, whole headset virtual um, church and somebody was in the corner the staff would be poking people and somebody they kept poking this guy and he wouldn't he wouldn't do anything and finally he lit up a sparkler in the virtual world and wrote China like there's that that was they China couldn't get couldn't block that or intercept writing in that way and so obviously praise God for technology when can be used to that end I was looking at something David Platt just did with AI that's translated him into uh Arabic, Spanish, and Portuguese, and it, his lips match, and it's his voice. It's his voice. I mean, it's amazing. What we would say is technology is good insofar that it's moving us toward what God has created us for, embodied worship and substantive membership or whatever other word you want to use, not as a replacement for it. That's the really important thing for us. We liken it to a Zoom, like a deployed soldier having a Zoom relationship with his wife. Necessary for a time, but not at all the ideal. And the same thing we would say would be true of embodied worship. 
Well, if this has got your mind going, then you need to make a beeline over here to Campbell 110 for the brown bag. Let's just consider this time setting the table and uh, we, can, we can further that conversation over there. Um, by the way, the first 30 people that show up over there will receive lunch and the next 100, you can watch the meat. <laughs> so... Better hurry. Let me pray and uh, close our time. Father, our hearts uh, have been uh, challenged today to hear what the realities of, of folks no longer going to church are. But we thank you for this well done research and also for the heart with which it's presented. Lord, there's great hope uh, for the church because even in the midst of what might for many seem like dismay and disaster, there's always a resurrection. And your Holy Spirit is at work, cleansing, reproving, uh, making your bride ready for you. Lord, may we be a part of that and cooperate with what you're saying to us uh, as believers and as church leaders. Thank you for this time. In Christ's name, amen.